Hello, and welcome to Maybe I'm Wrong About Guns, a live debate where we try to think through a thorny, divisive issue while at the same time trying to keep an open mind. Welcome to those of you who are joining us here in Vice's Brooklyn headquarters, and welcome to those of you joining us on Facebook Live. My name is Krishna Andavolu, and you may know me from such shows as Weedikit. And you might be thinking to yourself, what's the weed guy doing trying to talk about an issue as complex and as grave as gun violence in America? And furthermore, what's the point of debating? What difference does any of this make? So before I introduce um, our debaters, Chelsea and Maj, um, I wanted to take a second to try to explain where I'm coming from, what we're trying to do today. Uh, gun violence in America is a seemingly intractable issue with a complex history and tragic real life stakes. Uh, it's something that's often cast in black and white in the media. And I believe that the answers, or people's opinions really, lie somewhere in between, in the gray. Uh, so I'm hoping to take this opportunity to understand the strong opinions that we have, uh, to understand what we can do and what we should do to decrease gun violence and gun deaths in America. So in a sense, this debate, this event, is a kind of experiment. I want to know if we can make media that emerges from a self-inquisitive point of view, where you and I recognize that even though we walk into this room with a set of preformed opinions and lived experiences, that perhaps, possibly, maybe, there's more to the story, and we might gain more insight if we're willing to inhabit the reasoning of others. So why then a debate? Why pit arguments against each other? Doesn't that sort of just feed into the us versus them mentality of politics today? I don't think debate has to be that. I think this debate is about activating our brains to consider viewpoints that might not conform to our own. So in service of that, we're going to track how people's minds are changing through this debate. Uh, we've devised a format, or a sort of borrowed a format, frankly, where before each topic, we're going to take a tally of how the audience feels about the topic. We're going to debate two tonight. Um, and at the end of that topic, we'll re-tally what people think. So you'll vote twice at the beginning and at the end of each topic. Um, and in the meantime, we'll also field questions from Facebook comments. So, and we'll take those questions and put it to our debaters. Um, so please, ask questions, interrogate the sources, fact check if you, if you can, and question everything that's put out in front of you. Uh, we're hoping this to be interactive, live, uh, informative, civil, and useful to sort of understanding where we are today and where we want to go. Um, and a, a, second, a second kind of uh, motive is to understand that our voices matter, that our opinions matter, and that we can exercise those voices and opinions by voting. So next Tuesday is National Voter Registration Day. And we at Vites are going to do everything we can to inform our audience, inform as many people as we can about how to register to vote, uh, what are the issues that are at stake, including gun violence in America, and getting people out to the polls come November. And so we have two really uh, great debaters who've been kind enough to join us. Uh, to my right is Chelsea Parsons. She's the vice president, let me get the card, of gun violence prevention policy at the Center for American Progress. Uh, tell me a bit about yourself, Chelsea. Yes, thank you for having me, for being here. I lived in this neighborhood 18 years ago. I'm very excited to be back. Mm -hmm. um, so um, as you said, I run the gun violence prevention policy program at the Center for American Progress, which is a DC-based uh, progressive think tank that focuses on a wide variety of issues that are um, really have a real world impact on people's lives every day. Um, so I have been in this role doing this work for about five and a half years, starting right after uh, the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School. And to my left is Maj Touré. He is a gun rights education and rights activist from Philadelphia who founded an organization called Black Guns Matter. Maj, tell me a bit about yourself. All right, well, first, thanks for having me. Um, appreciate you all for coming out. Um, basically, you know, we, we started seeing some of the same problems with trauma, same, some of the same problems going around the country before this, you know, making music. I would see, you know, guys have simple possession charges. They're going to jail, not because they did something unlawful with the firearm, but um, they just had the firearm. They were missing the information, guys that have never been convicted of a crime before, ever, mm -hmm. right? And now they have a felony on their jacket. You know, they got that, you know, scarlet letter on them and things like that. So we created an organization where we give free firearm safety, uh, conflict resolution, de-escalation, um, and just some more um, healing 
for some of the issues that are going on in urban America, especially around firearms. So um, we started the organization. Um, we've gotten everybody involved in, you know, um, mental health, you know, stability, as a better way to say it, um, voting, you know, and a lot of the, uh, you know, the earlier issues that you were saying, even with marijuana, things like, because all of these things are related, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, um, you know, we started it. Um, we're crowdsourced, and we've been to about 50 cities giving these free classes around the country. Great. Well, thanks again for both of you for joining us. So we'll dive right in. Uh, the way this is going to work is I'm going to assert a statement, make an assertion. Uh, and that statement, you will either agree or disagree with, and then our debaters will de debate on the agree or disagree side. So the first statement it reads as such. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because criminals don't follow laws, stricter gun laws won't lessen gun violence. So we will open up the polls uh, for voting. If you agree with this statement, uh, leave a comment on the Facebook Live page, hashtag agree. If you disagree with this assertion, hashtag disagree. So again, the assertion is, because criminals don't follow laws, stricter gun laws won't lessen gun violence. Um, so Chelsea, if you'll please kick us off. I disagree. Oh, I'm so. <laughs> okay, and sorry, one, one more thing. So we'll leave the polls open for a couple minutes, and then we'll come back to the poll uh, at the end to see what the results are. So Chelsea, please, I think you can stand up if you like. I'm gonna, can I sit? You can sit. Okay. Do your thing. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, and you're timing me? Great. Yes, you have five so, minutes. Um, so I disagree. Um, we, we know that gun laws are effective at helping reduce gun deaths. And we know this for a couple of different reasons. Um, the first is if you take an international comparison, compare the United States with other high-income nations around the world, you'll see that on every measure of gun violence, whether it's homicide, suicide, um, the United States far outranks our peer nations. So the gun murder rate in this country is 25 times higher than in peer nations. Um, young people in this country are 82 times more likely to be murdered with a gun than their peers in other countries, right? And so we know that we aren't a more violent culture generally. We don't have more violent um, media and movies and video games, right? We don't have more um, r higher rates of mental illness than our other countries, but we have a lot more guns and we have gun laws that are substantially weaker than the laws in other countries. Um, the second way that we know that gun laws can be effective at reducing gun violence is actually a comparison within the United States from state to state. So um, federal law sets the, the floor when it comes to certain aspects of gun laws, but states are free to legislate in this area as well. And there's a wide variety from state to state when it comes to uh, gun laws. You have states that have um, very, very strict laws in place, states like New York, um, and then you have places like uh, Louisiana that have very few regulations on, on firearm ownership. Um, and what we know is that when you compare states that have stronger gun laws to states that have weaker gun laws, um, rates of gun deaths are higher, um, generally speaking, in the states that have weaker laws. And so um, we did some research a couple years ago looking at data from the CDC and FBI um, and found that the 10 states um, with the weakest gun laws collectively have an average rate of gun violence that's three times higher than the 10 states with the strongest gun laws. And so there's something at play there that I think suggests that some gun laws can be effective um, at reducing gun violence. Um, the other example that I'll point out, which I think is really powerful, is um, the specific experience of one kind of law um, that was um, repealed in Missouri but implemented in Connecticut. Um, and it's a, uh, a law called a permit to purchase. So it's a requirement that before you're allowed to purchase a handgun, you first have to go through um, a background check and obtain a permit to be able to do so. Missouri had this law in place, repealed it, and gun murders in the state went up 25% as a result. On the flip side, when Connecticut implemented this kind of law, um, gun murders fell 40%. And so there's a lot of evidence that suggests that certain kinds of stronger gun laws can be effective at reducing um, the rates of gun deaths um, in this country. And the other thing that I'll say about the argument that um, we shouldn't have gun laws because criminals don't follow the law um, is that that argument can be made about any kind of law, right? We don't say that we shouldn't have um, speeding, lim you know, sp speeding limits or stop signs because people will always run through them or people will always speed, right? Laws are in place to set expectations 
for conduct um, and to set kind of norms uh, for behavior, right? And so I think that it's important that we have laws in place that do that um, with respect to guns um, and that, uh, you know, just because a particular kind of law won't be 100% effective 100% of the time doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to make policy that can have an impact um, at reducing uh, rates of gun violence in this country. And the last thing I wanted to say on this particular point is that when we're talking about um, how can we reduce gun violence in this country, I think that we too often, the debate focuses only on laws. We need to make more laws and more laws and more laws, right? And I think that there's a huge um, other piece of this, which is looking at programmatic approaches to address different types of violence and gun violence, right? Um, to talk about um, local violence intervention programs, right, that really deal with and help address root causes of violence. Um, you know, talking about programs and educational um, opportunities around the issue of suicide. Um, two thirds of gun deaths in this country are suicides. And so um, if we're just focusing on laws, we're missing other parts of um, smart policy and smart ideas for how we can address gun violence and reduce gun deaths in this country that don't necessarily rely on um, Congress or state legislators or local lawmakers to enact more laws to do that. Um, so uh, in my final seven seconds, I would just say that, you know, I disagree with the premise that we shouldn't try um, to enact laws to reduce gun violence simply because they won't always be uh, followed or effective. Okay, thank you, Chelsea. And Maj. Your yeah. opening statement. Yeah, I agree with the, the premise. You agree um, with the premise? Absolutely. Um, for one, you know, you got places like, I, I know she brought up, uh, you know, a few states and things like that, but with the biggest example we have of places that I've been to, I've moved to Chicago for a month and a half to do conflict resolution, um, they have every law. They have all of the gun laws. Their homicide rate is through the roof. You know what I mean? So, no, that, that I do agree with that. If I'm the bad guy, I don't care about the rules. That's it. There's like rules against murder. Like, whether it's a knife, a gun, a bat, you know, hands, all of those different things. There's rules there already. That's number one. Number two, you know, just like she said, you know, towards the end of, you know, around the seven seconds left, she said, um, you know, we have to find out more productive approaches. That means that more laws are not working because we need something more productive. If this was working and we keep making more of them, then we would see a drastic decline and we are not, right? Um, so there's, some, there's some, some heavyweight behind, you know, like some of the work that, um, that we're doing at Black Guns Matter, as well as Walk the Talk America, which is focusing on the mental health component and making sure that the gun community is heavily involved in addressing, policing our own. Hey, 70-year-old granddad that was in several wars. Hey, dementia's kicking in. Maybe we should talk to them about, hey, let me clean your guns this weekend. Hey, coming up with productive ways of getting those firearms. Just like you take the keys out of your 70-year-old granddad's you know, hands, because granddad, you have dementia, you know, things of that. So those are more productive avenues. Um, but as far as like, you know, like saying, if we continue to add more laws, because no law is gonna be completely 100%. At a certain point, the sun is gonna stop. It's, we, we're used to it, we're contingent upon it, you know, we, we, we've consistently been around it, you know, but at a certain point, it's, it's a star, it's gonna go away. So it's not 100%, even though you've placed your entire thing around it. I think. The, the key component here is um, we, can, we can throw stats out. Stats is cute, and, and I like stats. You know, math is math sometimes. The problem is if we put so much leverage on that to the point where we're also utilizing tools to stop people's personal rights. We live in America. I don't, I don't live anywhere else. You know, we, we're talking about these other countries and things of that nature. That's not where I live. I live in North Philly. I'm concerned about the person that is experiencing a trauma from the ignorance around that firearm. So if that means, you know, Wilmington got with the CDC in 2013, they did a study, and they showed exactly these are the people that are doing the same, those small amount of guys, bad guys, that are doing the crimes, and they keep doing the same crime. How can we adjust? How can we help them socially? How can we help them financially? How can we help get them jobs? And then that's a solution. But to add another rule onto that scenario doesn't solve it for a person that already feels as if, you know, um, or a, a group of people that already feel like this trauma, I can do this, it's cool, I'm not gonna get caught, I got bail money, things of that nature. Um, so no, I, I agree. If I'm the bad guy, I do not care about more rules. And, you know, I just think it's, you know, it's a violation of people's rights. It's a violation of people's rights 
to continue to add more restrictions to people that are not the bad guy, that want to protect themselves from the bad guy. Just because I live around a bad guy, well, I'm, I'm like cool with the killer. Like I'm supposed to just be okay with it? No, I want the means, the most effective means to defend my, my life, my loved ones, and things of that nature. You know, so um, I think we're hamstringing. I, I get when people that have more of a anti-gun perspective because they're, you know, moving more off to the trauma and the fear or their unawareness of what a firearm actually is. Um, but, you know, those people tend to move in a way that violates other people's rights as opposed to just the, the guys or the girls doing the bad thing. Our job is to find solutions that we can, you know, limit the trauma as well as preserve and protect, you know, the human right to self-defense. Okay, um, so you guys all voted uh, how you feel before both Chelsea and Maj started, and we're going to ask you to vote again after they are finished debating this topic to see if minds have been changed. Um, so now that we've done these opening statements, I'll put it back to you, Chelsea, for two minutes to uh, offer counterarguments to what Maj was talking about. Yeah, except first I want to um, point out places where we agree. Sure. Um, so I absolutely agree with... Um, the point that we need to do much more um, and invest a lot more, we're talking about money, investing in community-based programs that are helping people deal with the trauma of living in neighborhoods that experience high rates of gun violence. And that is something that has not happened. Um, and we know that there are a lot of programs that are really effective at helping in a lot of these communities. I also agree with um, the need to really engage, and, and that, and this is something that shouldn't be me engaging, like I love that you do this, right? It, you know, engaging with gun owners and gun dealers and gun ranges about looking for signs of people who um, are in trouble, right? Who kind of need some intervention, who may be kind of heading into, you know, a period of having suicidal impulses, right? And so kind of that is a really big part of this and it's something that I know that there is increasingly more, um, effort going into that. Um, and, and there's a lot of programs, kind of partnerships between gun dealers and suicide prevention advocates, which I think are really smart and important. Um, you know, th the other, what I would say is, um, you know, you mentioned Chicago, and I think the Chicago example really, to me, highlights the need to not just have states dealing with with this, um, you know, a lot of the guns that end up being used on the street in Chicago come from Indiana, right? And so there, we have this movement of guns around the country from states that have weaker laws to states with stronger laws. And so part of, um, I think, what we need to do, and part of the, f I think we need to put more focus in these conversations on the gun industry itself, um, on the fact that we have, um, an industry with dealers and manufacturers and importers that's almost entirely unregulated at this point because the federal agency responsible for that can't really do it. And mm -hmm. so I think there needs to be more, we're talking about more laws. Um, I, I'm not just talking about laws that impact an individual gun owner, but Chelsea, I think I'm we need to, to look at the your... industry as well. Gotcha. Um, so Maj, what are your counter arguments? I think we gotta stop telling states what states should do with the people that live in that state. There's nothing, you know, I think we, uh, there's a great book called Please Stop Helping Us, right? And what we're running into is people saying, oh, there needs to be inter inter intervention on this area, this area. Okay, if you're from the community, these are community-based things that you have to stop having to save your complex of coming into communities, telling people how to solve their things. I think as we get, especially on a federal level, I'm not a fan of more government. I'm not a fan of people saying, oh, you should continue to do more of those things because we as big government say so. I disagree with that. Um, I also... Yeah, there are, there are things that are being done, but there's other organizations that they know that we have the data that shows these are the people, the bad guys that are doing the thing. You know what I mean? One, instead of even putting more money up, you can just keep those guys there and rehabilitate them. It's like simple, you know, as opposed to, again, letting them back outside because if they haven't been rehabbed, now I think a lot of times the reason why that's not happening is because big organizations that say they're gun violence prevention organizations also have stock in a lot of prisons. You know, so I think there's a there's a, 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 a huge contradiction there. And, um, you know, stop letting let the communities deal with the communities. Stop trying to tell other communities that you are not from, that you are not in, that you are not a part of how to fix their problems. You know, so so that whole the guns are coming from everywhere else thing. A gun is a gun. I don't I ain't worried about the, the, the bullet with my name on it. I'm worried about the bullet with no name on it. 
You feel me? So I think it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a contradiction, but there's areas where organizations like hers and, and mine can work together to set a much better precedent. Well, I'm happy to hear that there is some level of agreement between you guys, because I think that's the thing, the one thing I think we all agree on is that gun violence deaths can go down and should. Um, so with that, I think we'll turn to some audience questions. So you guys on Facebook have left a ton of comments um, on the live stream. And I'll start the first one uh, to you, Maj. And I think it's an interesting question because we are talking about the Second Amendment, right? If, if we think about the gun debate, you can't ignore a foundational right in our Constitution. Uh, so Ori Rav asks, can we be intellectually honest and believe that the Founding Fathers had the foresight to understand what guns would be capable of today? See, yeah, they, they, there were full auto machine guns then. There were? Yes. Got the puckle gun, you got, the, I mean, it's, they, they gotta do, that person doesn't know anything about guns. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so a lot of times what happens is we think that because, you know, that there weren't belt feds and things of that nature back then, we go, oh, well, they didn't mean, well, under that same logic, they didn't mean that freedom of speech, they didn't know you were gonna like use these sweatshop phones. They didn't know we were gonna have those, so does my freedom of speech stop here when I'm tweeting something that I wanna talk about? So that's, a, that's another contradiction, you know? So yeah, I do think that they had the foresight. I think that those guys, with their contradictions, this is a black man in America saying this, with those clear contradictions, freedom, equality for all men, oh yeah, slavery too, right? So I think there's a contradiction there, but those documents as is, I do think that when you isolate it to the Second Amendment, you know, I do think that there was some foresight because some of those things were already in existence, right? You know, and if not, again, the things that we're talking and t communicating with now would not be applicable under the First Amendment, so. And, but there are constraints on the First Amendment. First Amendment is an absolute. When it's in the public interest to, the uh, calling fire in a theater is sort of the classic example. That's against the law, it's prosecutable. So. You still have the free, see this is the thing. You have the freedom to do these things. The fa talk about foresight. Those founding fathers doubled down on that Bill of Rights. Those are things that are not granted by government. Those are things that, hey guys, if you guys get stupid in 200 years, right, double down on this. This is not something that your government gives you. This is your God-given inalienable right to express yourself. So yeah, freedom of expression or freedom of choice does not mean freedom from consequence, but it's still a freedom that you innately are born with. Mm -hmm. And so uh, to you, Chelsea, we have Tim Son Soderholm who's asking, what is your simple safety feature for guns? What is my simple safety feature for guns? Um, I don't know that I absolutely understand that question. I think when I um, am thinking about and talking about how, how do we, um, make laws that can have the impact of making gun ownership and making you know kind of guns safer in this country, right? We have 300 million guns or so in private hands right now at best count. Um, you know, I think it's a matter of having laws and policies in place that make the ownership of those guns as safe as possible. So part of that is, you know, considering what are the weapons um, that we think should be available to civilians at this point in our country. Um, part of that is, you know, what are the um, responsibilities that we ask of gun owners um, when they choose to own guns, when it comes to carrying those guns, when it comes to storing them at home, um, when it comes to trying to prevent um, against theft. Can you give some specific examples? Yeah, so for example, gun theft is a huge problem, and this is, I don't know if this is something that comes up in your classes, but th gun theft um, is, on the rise, both theft from gun stores. Um, ATF said robberies at gun stores are up 175% over the last couple of years. Um, and thefts from individual gun owners, particularly people are having their guns stolen um, out of their cars very frequently. This happens a lot in Atlanta outside of stadiums, right? Guns get stolen. So a gun is a weapon and it's a durable good, right? So if a gun gets stolen, um, there's 20, 30 years of that gun being able to be used by whomever um, 
to perhaps for criminal purposes, perhaps to kind of you know uh, target particular neighborhoods, right? And so I think it's really important if we're going to have um, an individual right to bear arms, which we have in this country, the Supreme Court has has found that to be true, right? Um, that has to come with some responsibilities to help make sure that those guns aren't being stolen at such a high rate, right? That they're not ending up in places where they shouldn't be. And so those are the kinds of things when I'm thinking about safety um, that I that I try to focus on. And I'll do one last question from the audience. I'll pose it to both of you. Uh, Mikey Wolf Kemper asks, are the bullets not going to be spoken of? Really? Which is to say, we've been talking about guns. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about gun laws. Mm -hmm. But bullets are pretty important, too, given that they are the actual projectile device that causes harm. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start with you, Maj. Like, what about bullets? Well, see, again, you got to tie into it. So, so for example, everybody's had this media mass thing about like hollow points. Like me personally, I carry hollow points. Hollow points are self-defense rounds. They do not over-penetrate, right? But mass media and a lot of politicians that are either A, unaware of what a, the, the ballistics of what a, a hollow point actually does because they don't shoot or don't know anything about firearms, they'll say those are illegal, right? In most states, y'all state, you have a slave state, especially in the boroughs that you guys are in, right, in regards to the Second Amendment. They'll say you cannot have hollow tips, and they'll tell you to get full metal jacket. Full metal jacket actually over-penetrates. So, so let's say the guy's coming to rape you, and you're a young woman, and you want to, you know, you're a lawful citizen, because they said that hollow points are unlawful. You have full metal jacket. You defend your life from the guy trying to rape you, and that round goes through that person and then hits the innocent girl behind him. Now, you were trying to defend your life, but the politician said, because they don't know about ballistics, they say you need to have FMJ, full metal jacket, that over-penetrates. See, these are the type of contradictions because we're on polar opposites a lot of times, and there's people that are aware of that in positions of power that just, it's about making the public unaware and not as informed and powerful as possible in regards to defending this, their self. Chelsea, what do you think? Yeah, I, I'm looking for agreement all over the place, so I am gonna agree with you on the point that we do have way too many policymakers who are writing bills about guns that don't know anything about the mechanics of firearms, which is a really big problem. And, and you know, I do a lot of work with, with legislators and, you know, they're very well-meaning people who want to have a bill, like I need a gun bill, right? And, and you know, a lot of, there, there, there is a definite need for more education for folks who are trying to make policy about the mechanics of firearms to, to know more what they're talking about. Um, the, you know, the, the place where I often talk about ammunition um, is in the context of high capacity magazines. So this mm -hmm. is something that we talk about a lot. Um, you know, these are often used in the very high profile mass shootings. Um, when you have um, high capacity magazines, which usually is defined as 10 or more rounds, I tend to talk about them like kind of 30 or more rounds, right? Um, those are what enable assault rifles to be uh, particularly deadly in these kinds of mass shootings, right? Because you have a person, often somebody who actually doesn't know a whole lot about guns to begin with, um, who is able to fire a lot of rounds very, very quickly um, without having to reload. And what we know is that in a lot of these cases, when they do have to stop and reload is when somebody is able to intervene. And so, um, you know, it, it is one of the things that we advocate for is to um, have more restrictions on uh, magazine capacity um, for this purpose of trying to reduce the lethality of some of these uh, shooting incidents. Okay, and so now we'll move on to sort of final statements about the assertion that because criminals don't follow laws, stricter guns won't lessen gun violence. So I believe... You, well, you have something to say, you go first. Yeah, so just real quick. Okay, okay. all right. So okay. Your, your definition of a high capacity magazine of 10 rounds or more, my Glock have, I can carry 16 in it, that's standard. That's a made up term, like gun violence, like assault rifle, those are made up terms. That's not, an assault is an action. My gun does not get up and start assaulting people. So when you, but it enables an assault if it's at a So high. does a knife. So does high cholesterol. I think those might be out of scope as far Not as Not out of the scope. So to. take London, for example. Less guns, knifing's through the roof. But, so my, but back, to the, back to the magazine part, though. Those are the type of terms, and they're vague areas. That's, that's, that's someone's perception. That's someone saying, well, I think you only need 10 rounds. Those people probably never been attacked by two people that are armed that, again, don't follow those rules. Okay, you so know? now we'll go move on to closing arguments. So as closing arguments are progressing, we will open up the polls again. 
Uh, so I encourage everyone in the audience to vote once more, hashtag agree, hashtag disagree, and really answer thoughtfully. Consider to yourself, listening to what these two have to say, is your mind changed at all? So Chelsea. Yep. So um, a lot of the time in these kinds of conversations and debates, um, we end up really focusing on kind of the nitty gritty and the policy and the, you know, the, this and the proposal and that. Um, I want to bring it back just to kind of the human impact for a second. Um, 96 people are killed in this country every single day with a gun. Um, so I think that we would all agree that that is a problem. And so I think that, um, you know, kind of coming from the uh, perspective of this is in fact a problem that we should try to fix, I think we can do better. Um, in this country, I think that having uh, strong gun laws in place is part of a comprehensive approach to doing that. I think that having strong laws in place um, should go hand in hand with um, a local programmatic approach. I think it should go um, hand in hand with having more robust oversight of the gun industry. Um, I think it should go hand in hand with having, uh, you know, police reform and criminal justice reform and sentencing reform and all of those things that are all interwoven and interconnected and all kind of play into each other. And we can't, we can't address gun violence without also addressing all of those other things as well. And so I think that there's not one answer and there's not one law and we say background checks all the time and I'll talk about background checks but like there's not one thing that we need to do that's going to fix this problem but I think that we need to be thoughtful and have a very comprehensive approach to looking at all of the different ways that our current laws and policies and culture feed into each other to create the situation that we're in now where we have this uh, tremendously high rate of gun death in this country. Okay, and to you, Maj, and to remind the audience again, you can vote, agree, or disagree as these closing statements are proceeding. So Maj, to you, what are your final thoughts? Yeah, we, we do have a problem. Um, and you know, again, the, the number that you gave, 96 people would die a day, you know, I don't know if that's 100% accurate, but there's a, a chunk of those, over 60% of that are suicides. You know, so like, we can't blame the tool for someone that has, you know, run into a feeling that we as a society have not assisted that person in serving that you know, that citizen in a manner that helps them feel in a different space, right? So I think that adding more rules um, to something where, again, 66% or 65% is an overwhelming majority of death around a certain thing. So if we ignore kind of like, we're, 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 like you said, we're kind of focusing on the gun more so than the social construct, the mental construct, the spiritual construct, you know, those are all things that I think take, have a much bigger impact um, than just adding more rules. Um, the other thing though too is, um, Again, we're in a space where we, we are tasked with balancing fixing the problem, healing from trauma, limiting that trauma, while protecting rights, not adding more restrictions to people's rights to defend their lives. That is the balance. So when we are overwhelmingly leaning towards more policies, more of those things that, truth be told, affect more law-abiding citizens than anybody else, right, we are not um, we're putting more energy into spaces that clearly are, they aren't working. That is not working. That kid in Parkland got the police called on him 38 times. Nobody said anything. Nobody. The, the sheriff came to his house a year before that. 38 times. We were neglecting that. Then when he gets super extreme, we blame the tool. That's not right. And more of the same is not going to fix it. We do need a comprehensive approach that deals with, again, I'm going to keep saying this organization. I am not paid by them at all. Walk the Talk America. That is literally, this is what, Suicide Prevention Month. You know, these are things that we have to do, shift our gaze just a bit there so we can balance it out a bit. Great. All right, well, thank you guys for the thoughtful discussion on this assertion. Um, again, if you guys haven't voted for on, on this, this first assertion, please do. We'll be closing the polls now. I found it pretty interesting that there was quite a bit of agreement between you guys. I think, generally speaking, there is a cleave between a lived experience and sort of an anecdotal understanding of the, the rights and responsibilities and under, like the understanding of owning and operating a, a firearm. And on the other hand, sort of population level data. So in a sense, there, if, if, if I'm gathering correctly from what I'm hearing from you guys, it's not just a uh, discussion about what is right and what is wrong or how, what right approaches there are, but the very data that should be used to assess 
what those approaches should be. And I think that's like, we're gonna be in the weeds for a long time if we're talking about data. So we will have the results from this first assertion in about 10 seconds. Um, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll plug it again, like next week, voter registration day. I think both of you guys agree that like the more young people vote, uh, you vote your experience, you vote your life, you vote your, what you want, and you vote for who will represent you best. So that's why we're doing this. And who, who are you voting for? In what? <laughs> I live in Brooklyn. Uh, so no, you guys has got a really good governor candidate, um, Larry Sharp. Well, let's put that aside for a second because we have <laughs> results. Okay, so this is, this is pretty interesting. So we're putting them on screen right now. Uh, for pre-debate, the assertion, because criminals don't follow laws, stricter gun laws won't lessen gun violence. Before we debated, 56% of you agreed that that was true. 44% of you disagreed. Post-debate, there was a big move. 82% agreed with that assertion, while 18% disagreed. So over the course of our discussion, people's minds change. So we'll move on. We've got one more. Uh, and this was one that you know, I got a lot of flack from as far as my own feelings on the issue, uh, specifically because it, it relates to common tools, a car and a gun. They are both wonders of human innovation that have changed the world around us for the better or for the worse, however you want to think about it. Uh, but they do, they represent ingenuity and something like wonderful about the human race is that we can make shit and we can make shit cool. Uh, so the second assertion is to prevent gun deaths, we should regulate gun makers like automakers. To prevent gun deaths, we should regulate gun makers like automakers. And so, polls are open now, so please comment with hashtag agree if you agree with that assertion, or hashtag disagree if you disagree with that assertion. And do remember that we'll ask you this again after the debate, uh, so please vote again then as well. All right, so this time around, we'll do five minutes again for opening statements. Maj, you're up. Um, so it's a, I'm a little bit, guns are already regulated more than cars are. So your, your assertion would be regulate them l less. Not, get them less. Not, yeah, so, because they already, I mean, cars, so say this again, cars, guns should be regulated like cars are. Well, specifically, it's we should regulate gun makers like auto makers. So we're not talking about the consumer. We're talking about the industry, as Chelsea brought up earlier. Okay. And I think that's a key distinction in a sense, because yes, okay. there are a lot of similarities between guns and cars on right. the consumer level, as in you have to license yourself, you have to go through classes. But let's talk about the industry. Okay, so the take the industry for example. Um, you can't even get a Glock in the state of California. That entire state, I have a friend who has a gun. He has his own signature gun, right? He cannot even ship his gun to California because it's a standard capacity magazine. 15, one in the head, right, 16. California's cap is like 10, I think, right? That's, that's one, bad for business. In California, that eighth or however much biggest, largest economy in the world, that's horrible for jobs, right? Um, so there's, there's a gang of regulation that's, that's already, that's, an, that's a manufacturer. You know what I mean? That's not at the consumer, and it does affect the consumer because if I want that really cool gun, I can't get it if I happen to live in California or Massachusetts or Brooklyn, you know? So um, I don't think that, I think what, again, the focus needs to be more on safety training and education, conflict resolution, de-escalation, not stopping jobs, not creating, re not blocking more revenue, not blocking people that can work into a factory and say, hey, I make magazines. I don't shoot people for a living. I have a good, well-paying job close to my home that I can sustain my family on manufacturing something that every other state in the union has access to except this one. You know, so, um, yeah, I think that, yeah, I don't know about that one. I, it's, it's, a, it's a loaded question a bit. Yeah, I think they should be regulated less because they already are regulated more than car manufacturers. Well, I mean, you disagree with the statement. So that, that, that's clear. It's simple, I, I, over, I overcomplicated it, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, so, just on the, automaker versus gun maker front. You've offered one example of a single gun maker who can't sell their equipment 
in California. Mm -hmm. So you mean the ability to manufacture that firearm? Well, you can manufacture it, you know, just like Chrysler can manufacture any car that they want. Each state has different rules that each manufacturer needs to respect. But car makers are not limited. If I can't not sell the 2019 Cadillac in California, that's already a more regulated thing that's on the manufacturer, right? It's just, but Cadillac is the same exact car. It can be sold there. That's a manufacturer limitation on the gun manufacturer, mm -hmm. not the car manufacturer. So, no, I, I disagree with that. Okay, well, you have two minutes left. Do you have anything oh, else I got to say? Oh, yeah, I got plenty of you time. Got plenty. Well, look, should I ask you? Look, my yeah. my, my follow-up to that would be basically on the federal level, there are federal regulations, safety-wise, mileage-wise, collision ratings. Like, the federal government is quite active mm -hmm. in regulating car manufacturers to meet certain standards right. for the public good. Yeah. That, perhaps, does not exist for gun makers. That's not true. Tell me. So, for one, I, I have a friend who owns a company called um, Daniel Defense. They're a, they're a rifle manufacturer, right? Good dude, big company. His, there are so many specifications, and he's like, it's called the ATF, mm -hmm. Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms. That's a federal organization. You smoke a cigarette, you have a sip of swig of some liquor, you have a firearm, you are federally regulated. Every time a person purchases a firearm, that is a federal form. The 4473 is a federal form. Yes, at gun shows, too. Every lawful purchase is going to go through a federal form. Every manufacturer, every FFL, Federal Firearms Licensee, they have to keep data up to 21 years. If the ATF, the federal organization, comes in and says, where's your record from 19 years ago? You better present that or you're going to lose your license. That is a federal licensing. That's, what, that, that's already in place. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of regulated already. Wait, how much? 28 seconds. Yeah, it's regulated a lot. I don't know how many times I can, it's regulated. <laughs> All right, well, you'll see the rest of your 20 seconds right. over to Chelsea. What do you think? Um, so first, I can't let one thing go, which is you said a couple minutes ago that, um, oh, you know, guns and owning a gun in your car, there are a lot of similarities. You have to get a license, et cetera. You actually don't need a license to buy a gun in almost every state in this country. So there are a handful of states where you need to get a license or a permit before you can even buy or own a gun. Um, but that is not the case in the whole country, there's no such thing as a federal gun license. Um, so I just, I can't, I couldn't, that, that, I just need to say that. Um, so, so I love this question because, again, as I said before, um, we often have this conversation and completely leave out the industry um, when we talk about it. And so, you know, the firearms industry is obviously a huge industry. It's a billion dollar industry. Um, and there are some just, quirks uh, in our system of, of federal laws in particular that really allow the industry to operate without the kind of oversight um, that you that other industries have to have to deal with for example so um, you know for example we you mentioned ATF um, ATF is one of the most um, beleaguered federal agencies in the federal government. Um, it is hamstrung not only by its budget, which remains largely stagnant, um, but by a series of restrictive uh, provisions that are put on its budget that limit um, what it is allowed to do. So for example, ATF um, is not allowed to um, digitize any of the records of gun sales that, that you mentioned. Um, those records have to stay in, in um, a non-searchable format with the gun dealer, so ATF can't have that information. Um, ATF is not allowed to inspect uh, a gun dealer more than once a year. Um, ATF is not allowed to uh, require gun dealers to do an annual check of their inventory to make sure that um, they can account for all the guns that are supposed to be in their inventory. Um, these are things that are just standard in other industries, um, you know, pharmaceuticals, things like that, where you have potentially dangerous items that are, that are consumer products. Um, ATF is so short-staffed at this point that most um, gun dealers go at least five years without ever getting um, any kind of compliance inspection from ATF. Um, and as a result, when ATF does inspect gun dealers, more than half of them usually have some kind of violation. And a lot of those are paperwork violations, and a lot of those are, um, you know, are, are rectified when they kind of go through and look, search their inventory and make sure they can account for all the guns um, that are sold. But, you know, 
gun dealers are really the, the point at which um, guns leave the, the, you know, and they leave the stream of commerce and enter into civilian and private hands, right? And so it's really important that um, the gun dealers um, are being held to a high standard, are making sure that they are um, on alert for straw purchases, right? That they are filling out all the forms accurately and doing background checks all the time. Um, you know, that they are following best practices, making gun locks available, and all of these things that they are required to do under federal law. Um, and so, Though that aspect, I think, of um, regulation of the gun industry is not as robust, certainly, as we would want it to be. Um, the other quirk in the federal law is that guns are not regulated for safety by a, a government agency. Um, guns are actually specifically, specifically excluded from the jurisdiction of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, and so there's no federal agency that is um, testing firearms before they come to market, that is um, looking for safety defects, and that's issuing mandatory recalls. And so the industry is actually um, expected to police itself when it comes to the safety of firearms that are being sold. And so you have a situation where you have um, firearms that have safety bugs, that um, there have been instances of guns that will fire when dropped, for example, and we really have to rely on the manufacturers themselves on kind of an honor system to be alerting consumers to that and, and issuing recalls. And that's another area where I think guns and the gun industry is treated very differently from other uh, similar industries, including the car industry. Um, so again, I think that, I think it's an interesting analogy. I think it's a useful starting point. Um, you know, I don't think that it's a complete one-to-one, -one, um, you know, yes, absolutely, every regulation on the car industry should be put on the gun industry. Um, but I do think that it's, that it's kind of an interesting jumping off point for this conversation. And the other thing that I, that I would say is that, you know, in the car industry, you have a lot of incentives to innovate. Um, and I just don't think that those same incentives, incentives to innovate are present in the, with respect to gun makers, right? And so you have, everybody loves to talk about smart gun technology, right? But there are um, burdens in place on the industry that are actually preventing innovation in that space. And so I think that's another area where, um, you know, we just need to do more work. Mm -hmm. Dimash, how do you respond? So no real shooter is going to tell you they want a smart gun. That's, that's where the market's going to decide that. Smart gun technology is trash. It's trash. It's just what it is. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to have a glitch in something that my life is depending upon or my children in the house in a moment. Like my iPhone freezes sometimes. I don't want my trigger to freeze at that point. Um, I think that the, the, the responsibility of safety is the responsibility of manufacturers, dealers, distributors, owners, consumers, all of that. People that, I, the, the worst thing that I hate, you know, hate, and that I chose that word very carefully, is people that are irresponsible with their, their right of firearm ownership, right? And I think that it, it is good that we police our own our, ourselves. Again, I'm not a fan of adding more government. Um, I think that there's a certain level of, you know when you're trained and informed in these things, and that translates up, you know, up the pyramid. So for example, if, if, if me as a firearm owner, or anyone as a firearm owner, you know your situation. Your child should not have access to that firearm. You should look into lock boxes. You should look into gun safes. You should, these are things that are standard, period. The danger is when we start telling people what they have to do from the government. That is a danger. That's a danger. I think that we have to be, you know, socially conscious, responsible citizens in that regard. And again, that translates, you know, up, you know, upstream. Um, I don't think that any, just the market will respond differently. The gun that you're talking about is the, the SIG P320 with the drop, and then it, you know, and they immediately called them back, not with the mandate. Hey, you can get the upgrade, we can fix that, and those things. Now, I think it's bad business because one, the internet's gonna light those guys on fire for some time. I'm not, get, if you got a SIG in the bay next to me, if you got that P320, please get away from me. And the market suffers, period. You know, I think there's a thin line. We can't say we're, a, we're an open and free society when we keep asking for more, you know, enslavement or people telling us what to do, which are just humans like us. It's just humans. It's not a special set of brains that these particular government agencies or agents have. They're humans prone to failure just like all of us. With that being the case, I don't think that gun manufacturers, not for a moral reason, but for a financial reason, I don't think it's in their best interest to make non-safe products no different than cars. 
You know, a car makes a mistake, Ford has, okay, hey guys, we're recalling these. Even if those regulations are in place from the Transportation Authority and, you know, on a national level, there's still a quirk that happens. And when that does, we, as the responsible car manufacturer, bring those back. Hey, bring that back. We'll fix that. We'll take care of that, right? Even if we catch it before fatality. Hey, guys, this was wrong. We need to fix this. I think that's just good business. And I think we got to kind of let the market decide in those spaces as opposed to asking for more masters. Um, and before I turn it to you, Chelsea, for rebuttal, I encourage everyone in the audience uh, on Facebook to please ask questions. Uh, we'll have 10 minutes after Chelsea's response to field questions from Facebook uh, to kind of push us further. Because I think we've, we've gotten to a really interesting point, I think, in this discussion as it's, a, dis, it's a, a jumping off point to talking about what the industry is and how free markets can regulate the way that industry behaves, but then perhaps how it might fail. So, Chelsea, to you. Yeah, I mean, and the other, I like the guns versus cars analogy too. Um, when you pull it back a little bit, not just from a focus on the industry actors, um, but pulling it back to looking at what did we do in this country to address car accident fatalities, right? Because we did something. Um, you know, 20 years ago, um, we made a decision that, that there were far too many car accident fatalities that were happening and that we needed to do something about it. And what we did was we looked at it from a public health perspective. And again, we took a comprehensive approach to, to addressing the problem. So part of that was laws. So you had DWI laws and seatbelt laws. Part of it was looking at um, the safety of roads themselves. And so you had um, you know, new regulations with respect to barriers and guardrails and things like that. Um, we had some culture shift, right? So you had, um, you know, groups like Mothers Against Drunk Driving and, and other groups um, really trying to shift cultural norms so that now it's really not culturally acceptable to drive while you're drunk or to, you know, have your kids in the backseat without seatbelts on. Um, and so we did all of those things together and we put in some research dollars into really figuring out and looking really ex specifically at what interventions will help reduce the number of people who, who die in car accidents every year. Um, and we had really good results for that. So from uh, 1999 to 2016, um, gun, or, sorry, car accident deaths went down 16%. And if you look at, um, I do this sometimes, but if you track um, gun deaths and car accident dr deaths on the same chart, you see cars go like this, and you see guns kind of go like this, right? And so to me, that says, we should take the example of how we approached car accident deaths and figure out how does it make sense to apply that to gun deaths as well um, to try to get to that same kind of result. Um, when we talk about the industry, and I'm surprised we haven't said th these three letters yet, but the industry has a very effective lobbying arm, the National Rifle Association. Perhaps it's not a licensing lobbying arm. We, could, we can debate that as well. But you called them quirks earlier as far as why the ATF is constrained in the way it is. Can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by that? Well, so, okay, um, they're, they're not quirks. I mean, they are very purposeful provisions in the law, um, many of which were enacted at the urging of the National Rifle Association. So it, it, that's, I mean, that's right, and it is funny we got this far without kind of mentioning It's kind them. of amazing, actually. Um, I don't like to lead with the NRA, <laughs> but I think that, I mean, it's, it's a huge factor, right? And I think that you have, um, you have an organization that, you know, really has become a very strong political organization and it certainly has arms of the organization that do programming and that are you know for sportsmen and, and recreational gun owners and all of that but it has a huge lobbying arm that has a ton of money that invests very heavily in campaigns and in elections and in lobbying lawmakers um, to at this point do nothing to address the gun violence problem in this country and so um, you know that is a very real uh, part of the dynamic in, in terms of the, this debate that we're having. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, Maj, what is your sort of thoughts on, is the NRA somehow... The NRA is responsible for my lineage having the means to defend themselves from racist Klan members. That's what the founding of that organization was for. Let's be very clear. All gun control is racist. Let's be very clear about that. How? Okay? Well, all of America at a certain point was a constitutional carry country. Then black people fought against enslavement 
to get their own liberation, then come the gun laws. Look it up. That's the origin of gun control. Everything else is a subsidiary of racism, gun control, incorporated. One of the major reasons why that happened for black people to protect themselves was the creation of the NRA. That's number one. Most people say these things. Well, no, but the NRA was in favor of uh, California. You're talking about the Mulford Act. Yes, I am. Right. Tell me about that. And then after that, Ronald Reagan and that ilk were removed. There was a coup with the NRA. Everybody should read into John Lott. Everybody should read, pick up some stuff on, uh, you know, the, the things. There was a, that entire regime was ousted, literally. Right? At that time, they were focusing more on sporting and hunting, and that regime was removed. Right? Then we can fast forward it a bit. We can talk about my friend from Philadelphia, Shanine Allen, who went across the bridge in Jersey, single mom, was being held in New Jersey, had a, had a license to carry, had a firearm, went to jail, hundreds of thousands of dollars in legal fees the NRA paid to support and get her out of that situation. I know the things that, for whatever reason, the NRA don't want to talk about, I don't know why, but I think they should highlight it more. I know about Otis McDonald in Chicago when that racist practice of gun control in Chicago was trying to stop Saturday night specials. Black people, which were cheap revolver firearms that they can protect themselves, I know that the NRA got behind him. But it's interesting because in, in a sense it's like a lot of, you're saying a lot of African American people what, don't Also, know wait, real quick, I want to just make this clear. I have never received a dime from the NRA. They should, you guys, if you're watching, you should give me a million dollars to continue doing this work. But with that being the case, the facts are the facts. And if you're missing the okay. core components of that. So we're going to move on to sure. uh, closing statements. But I, I, got, I do kind of want to address this idea because you're bringing it up. But is gun control racist? So yes. I, so this is what I'm going to say about this, is that I disagree that all gun control is racist, right? However, I totally agree that many of our current laws, criminal laws, some of our gun laws, absolutely were and are discriminatory, either by design or as applied. And I don't think that we can have a conversation about gun control policy in this country without acknowledging that and without being very cognizant about how do we make policy in that context, trying to do good, without exacerbating all of those other um, factors that I mentioned earlier, right? All of the other parts of the criminal justice system um, that are deeply damaging to people of color in this country, right? So, and I think that that's something that folks on my side often don't acknowledge and gloss over and try to kind of push past. And so I think it's very important, and I, and I completely agree on that point. But the other thing is that it is also true that the burden of gun violence in this country falls very, very heavily on people of color. Um, and, you know, more than 50% of murder victims in this country are African American. And many, many times, lawmakers and policymakers don't care about those deaths, and they don't acknowledge them, and they don't pay attention to them, and they only pay attention to Parkland and to other, these other shootings, right? And that is also unacceptable. And so that's kind of where I come from, which is, let's take both of those things as true. How do we do better? And I think that part of doing better is some of our system of laws, and we can agree or disagree on that. And I think part of doing better is being much more invested in solutions coming from the community um, and in giving voice to solutions coming from the community, right? Like, I have a fairly big platform where I work. I try to lift that shit up every time I can, right? Because the people in Congress need to know about the kids in Hartford who, with $200,000, have completely changed different parts of that neighborhood, right? And so I think that's where I come from on this issue, and that's where I think if we really sit down and kind of like just do it and ha hash it out and do the work, I think we can get to a place where we can start to make change and we can start to make our, all of our communities safer without continuing to exacerbate all of that other shit that the criminal justice system has been perpetuating for decades. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we have one more Facebook question and then we'll go on to closing arguments. Uh, let's see. Yeah, oh, here's a good one from Brandon Bloom. Um, to both Maj and Chelsea, 
what should be done about citizens' ability to make firearms unbeknownst to the government? I think that... Are we talking about 3D guns, We're, we're talking about 3D printing, I bet. I want to hear what you have to say about 3D printed guns. Um, I think that, first of all, thank you for acknowledging that. There are people that are going to watch this that have no idea that someone from your background is going to understand and respect the trauma that people from my hood across America are going through. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's nobody's business. It's nobody's business. If I make a knife in my house and nobody gets stabbed, we're good. <clears throat> if I make a 3D gun, printed gun, and I have the right to protect my life in my home or my life generally, right? It's nobody's business. Where you have a problem with me is when you do an irresponsible thing with that tool that makes it harder for that community, that creates more trauma for my, my hood, and it makes it harder for gun owners across America because that person is splashed as, look at this crazy guy with the printer in the back, Xerox and guns out, right? So to me, as long as you're responsible, I, a person generally carries a firearm the same reason that a good law enforcement officer does, to protect the good people against the bad people if and when it happens to come, you know, pop off that way, right? So as far as the 3D print and gun thing, I'm just, yo, if, if some people might not have the means Guns are not cheap, like good ones, right? So with that being the case, if there's something that um, is going to be more respective of individual uh, rights, personal human right to self-defense, personal property, and respecting those things, I'm all in for that liberty. You lose me completely. You lose me completely when you are irresponsible with your rights. I'm not one of those guys with the Second Amendment is my carry permit and all. No. There needs to be a balance, a holistic approach to this situation. You, I'm going to be in control of me and my property. You're going to be in control of you and your property. And that includes the 3D guns that you're Xeroxing, because you still need to get bullets. And those are not like plastic, you know? So that's my position on it. Chelsea, what do you think about 3D yeah, guns? Yeah, so I'm going to acknowledge something that some of my peers are probably going to get upset with me about. I think we got a little hysterical about the 3D printed gun thing recently. Hmm. Um, it is still very expensive to get the kind of 3D printer that would be necessary to print a fully functional 100% plastic 3D gun. So I'm gonna, I wanna be reasonable and admit that kind of thing. On the other hand, I think it is, there is a perspective risk, right? And I think the reason that I get concerned about 3D printed guns, and, and we know technology is only going to get better and cheaper, so I mean, there will come a time where it's not prohibitively expensive to get a printer and make one of these guns, um, is the, the fact that these guns are going to be untraceable mm -hmm. and that they're going to be undetectable so that you can get them through security. Um, they're an assassin's gun. Um, there was a journalist in Israel who did an experiment, which I think is probably not smart, um, of sneaking a 3D printed gun into parliament to make the point that it could be done, right? And so, um, you know, those are the concerns about um, the potential harm of this technology and why we're talking about it, why we should be talking about it now in terms of kind of how can we, how can we kind of have this innovation and encourage innovation, um, but at the same time making sure we're not creating risks down the road that are going to be out of our control. How? With the 3D printed guns? Yeah. So my pitch has been, um, it's not new laws. I, I don't have a new law for this. Although there is legislation, I support the legislation, no. But what I have been arguing is that we need to have the um, tech industry, the manufacturers of 3D printers, step in and say, is this an intended use of this technology? Um, and if it's not, are you willing to put some software controls in place that will prevent people from being able to make fully functional firearms? And, and the analogy here is that um, you cannot use Photoshop to make counterfeit money. It mm. won't let you. And so I think that we should look to the industry to innovate and say, hey, we don't intend for these printers for this technology to be used for this purpose, so we are going to innovate a way to kind of prevent that future harm from coming to fruition. Okay, very interesting. You have a quick yeah, response? Yeah, yeah. So one, okay, you can have the fully printed gun, right? Bullets, there's, there's things that are, they are encased in that shell for its metal. It's, 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 it's a, some sort of metal. You cannot have 
even if he got the gun in the parliament, there's no bullets. Bullets go through metal detectors. Bullets are, rounds are metal. There, it's an explosion that happens when that firing pin hits that, ignites it, explosion with the gunpowder, sends the round out the shell a different way. That has to be encased in metal. It has to, period. So the concept of, um, oh, we can make these guns and they'll just be able to be undetectable, that's not true. That's not accurate, Matt, scientifically inaccurate. Right? Um, there's an explosion in those rounds. So when we're talking about ammo and bullets and things like that, that's, that's a thing. Um, and also, again, stop asking for more enslavement from a federal government. This has never been a good thing for innovation, for money. Well, no, for it's, it's been a good thing for uh, mileage standards in cars. Okay. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> With that being the case, I am not a fan of ask, it's blocking innovation. And when we have a conversation about now saying, can we get tech companies to block somebody from expressing? Well, okay, so let's, we're gonna move on to uh, yeah, statements, because yeah. I think you yeah. go first. So, is that right? Does he go first? I, don't, I actually can't remember. Yeah, yeah take, so, okay, take away. so the closing statements. Um, all I'm saying, y'all, man, is just, firearms are a fundamental part of American history, right? And if I, as a black man in America, can say that as this is where it's helped us, and these are some of the areas that it has harmed us, um, we have to find that balance between figuring out how we can maximize on the protection. I do not trust our government. I'm pretty sure most of the viewers and the people, you know, w w whether you like this current regime or not, I'm pretty sure a lot of people are going, eh. So if you're asking for more restrictions on the American citizens, not the people doing the wrong things, if you're asking for more restrictions on the citizens, you're actually not asking for more for less gun ownership. You're kind of like asking for a monopoly of those firearms to go in a certain group of people's hands, like the government. That has never like worked out well for the citizens of whatever government in human history, in human history, right? So you can't on one hand say, oh, we need more restrictions, we need more of these things, but we also have a regime. Some people are like anti-Trump, right? Okay, so if he's the Hitler guy. Why would you give the monopoly of firearms to the Hitler guy? It's a contradiction. This place was founded on the principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, of this is the Constitution we declare our independence from a completely tyrannical situation, and we have firearms to defend these beliefs, and these list of things, these amendments, right, these Bill of Rights, these things are here to make sure that we remember that this is not a government given thing. That's it. So when you don't have the means to defend yourself from a government that can potentially be tyrannical, all of your other beliefs do not matter. If I'm Muslim, if I'm Christian, if I'm Islamic, it does not matter. If you do not have the means to defend your value systems and your beliefs, you don't have any. So be a little bit more mindful about some of the things, find more productive, um, please reach across the aisle to people that you think would have nothing in common with you. And as you're seeing, we have kind of a lot in common on a lot of different issues because nobody's asking for or agreeing with more trauma, you know? Um, and before Chelsea, your closing argument, I'll remind people that the polls are open for this last assertion, this last topic. Uh, so if you agree, hashtag disagree, hashtag, if you, if you agree, Hashtag agree. If you disagree, hashtag disagree. So Chelsea, please take us home. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I'm going to do one more stat, um, and I've really limited myself tonight, so I just want everybody to appreciate that. Um, <laughs> just to highlight again the, the problem, right, the reason that we're here. Um, so guns are currently uh, the leading cause of death in this country for young people, second only to drug overdoses. And that's only because drug overdoses, which is the subject of a whole other show, right, have spiked dramatically. And so, like, we are losing way too many people to, to gun deaths. Um, and, you know, there's, we can do a lot better. Um, and so that's, that's why I think we're here. That's why I think, you know, there's so much passion on each side of this because, um, you know, we all care a lot about this country and about kind of what's happening in it. Um, you know, the Second Amendment has come up and, and the Second Amendment is 
in the Constitution, and it is part of this conversation and, and, and part of what we're talking about. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, Justice Scalia himself said in the Heller decision, um, it's not an absolute right and it is subject to reasonable restrictions to help ensure that all of our communities are safe. And I think that is, that's where the real meat of this conversation is, is, is where, can we, where can we work in that space to try to figure out places where we can do better? Um, and so, so that's kind of what I offer here. And, and, and look, I think we've tried the let's have as many guns as we possibly can in our country and in our community approach, right? Like 300 million plus guns, we've done that. I feel like it's not working very well. And so I think that we should try maybe something else. Um, and so that is, uh, that is kind of where I come from on this issue. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's in, in a sense, polls are still open, please do vote. We'll, we're gonna close them very soon. Um, and as we wait for the results of that poll, what I think I'm hearing in a sense is like, you're trying to operate in a space where reasonable restrictions, as Scalia had mentioned, can be applied for the public good. But you're coming from a position where there are no reasonable restrictions. Is that fair? Um, no, okay. that's, not, that's not where I'm coming from at all. I'm saying that we all have already been restricted and we're, not, we're adding more restrictions but not solving the thing. If 66% of people are killing themselves with firearms, the issue is not the firearm. The, the, the stat game that's being played is, okay, we're gonna ignore this 66% that has a serious mental issue. We're gonna ignore that. We're gonna keep in there, you know, when a law enforcement officer shoots the bad guy, that's in there as those 30,000 deaths a year too. We're gonna leave, we're gonna totally not talk about the millions of times firearms are used to prevent death. That's another little tricky part that's not in the conversation. So we do have restrictions already there. Most law-abiding gun owners are restricting themselves, de-escalating, and those things. What we're not trying is, I hear we say it, we, we say, oh, we need to try something else, but trying to push for more restrictions on the firearm, when clearly the issue is a mental health issue, is another contradiction. So, and I'll put it to Chelsea. Is, is mental health a contradiction? So, and thank you. And, and the polls are closed now, but we're still waiting. Yeah, and, and just to talk about the suicide point for a second. Um, and again, I agree that, you know, there's two thirds of gun deaths are suicides, right? And so like that, we gotta, that is, we need to focus there too, right? Um, what we know is that firearms are the most lethal method used when people uh, attempt suicide, right? So 85% of suicide attempts with a firearm results in death. All of the other methods that are used, there's only a 5% lethality rate. And so what we know is that uh, suicide is often an, an impulsive act. It, it often it is not the product of a lot of planning. And so um, if somebody has access to a gun in that moment, they're much more likely to end up dead. Um, than if they don't have access to a gun. And the other thing that we know is that um, most people who survive a suicide attempt don't later go on to die by suicide. And so that is, I don't have an answer to how we kind of really deal with that, but those are the dynamics at play when we're talking about gun-related suicide. And so um, I do think that, um, you know, there is a mental health aspect of that, but access to the most lethal method is a really big part of that conversation. Okay, great. Well, it looks like the polls are in. Uh, <clears throat> and so pre-debate, 22% um, of the audience agreed with the assertion that we should regulate gun makers like all makers, automakers and 78% disagreed. After the debate, not a big change, but it went from 20, it went to 25% agree and 75% disagree. So Chelsea, you won that round, so to speak. But I think I am heartened by how much common ground we found today. And I'd like to thank everyone on, on Facebook, here in the audience, for participating in it, because this is an issue that feels like it isn't gonna go anywhere. Uh, it's been an issue since I was a teenager, and it m most likely will be an issue, which is to say, like, when people die before it's time for them to die, so to speak, biologically, like, we can do things about it. And we are a technologically advanced, rich nation who has done fantastic things in the past and potentially can do fantastic things in the future. And to one point that I'll come, that you brought up, because I think it's interesting, 
is if the government is tyrannical, or if our belief the gov is that the government is tyrannical, bottom line, we elect those people. And we can talk about sort of voter irregularities or the ways that, that voting works, and that, that again is an issue for another day, but we still can vote as citizens of this country. Which will bring me to the final point, of course, which is that Tuesday, National Voter Registration Day. National Voter Registration Day, yes. So uh, if you're not registered to vote, register. If you are registered to vote, turn up on Election Day, because I think it only takes two minutes to register, and there's plenty of resources on Vice uh, to direct you to how to get there. Um, so thank you all for coming, and thank you to both debaters for the civil, open-minded discussion, and we'll hope to do something like this again in the future. Okay. Please clap.